I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us uh, this afternoon as we launch the inaugural Dean's Lecture Series. Uh, this is an idea that came out of uh, Dr. Rungi's uh, EVP May office, and you'll see this on a regular cadence as we uh, go throughout the year. Before we get started, I'd just like to spend a little bit of time sharing with you our strategic plan, because inflammation and immunology plays a very fundamental role of the strategic plan that we have going forward. Matter of fact, this is our third strategic plan, which is titled Great Minds, Greater Discoveries. The first strategic plan started in 2009 when the university purchased the site that we're sitting in right now. This site used to be owned by Pfizer uh, Pharmaceutical Companies, as many of you may know. We bought 32 buildings and about 150 acres, which we are still mowing, for about $108 million. It was pennies on the dollar, and it's been instrumental in allowing us to launch a number of programs to use the space here at Pfizer, the old Pfizer site. In about 2015, we launched our second strategic plan, which was called Fast Forward for Tomorrow's Cures. Many of you may remember that because many of you in the audience helped us construct that. And it was really directed at trying to build the infrastructure that was missing in the medical school. And we invested in a biorepository, we invested in our core facilities, we invested in many of those aspects that would allow us to fundamentally move science. Right before COVID hit, we launched our third strategic plan, which is Greater Minds, Greater Discoveries. And one of the reasons that we really need these strategic plans is that we need to be great stewards, we need to be great protectors of this institution. And this is just some of the metrics that we follow. And this is as uh, current as of uh, June 30th of, of this year. And you can see that we're approaching almost $800 million in total awards that come in. Over half of that is through NIH awards, through the sweat of your all brow, uh, we go out and uh, compete for these grants. We are currently ranked number 13, but that ranking fluctuates from 13 up to number six, uh, depending upon what sort of uh, large grants our peer institutions or we are, 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 are securing. Uh, I can give you an example. A couple of years ago, UCLA went from 12 to number two because they secured a very, very large HIV grant. So you have to take a little these with a little bit of salt, and I think what you do is just need to look at the long-range uh, fundamental rankings that we have. We have about $155 million in industrial support. Most of that is directed to help out our clinical research and clinical trials. And you can see that our expenditures uh, are north of $650 million. And some of the metrics that we follow, these aren't the, all of them, but some of them, is we look at our invention reports of how innovative and how much of towards a commercialization aspect that we have. And you can see that we have almost 250 last year. One thing that I'd like to score is the number of publications coming out. Uh, again, from your all laboratories. We publish 32 manuscripts a day in peer-reviewed publications from this institution. So we do very well in this respect. And this is why we really need to make sure that we have a strategic plan laid out that we can guide us in the future. And the current strategic plan is based on five uh, strategies. The first is that we want this place to be the destination, not just for our faculty, but for our learners and our staff. And we've done a number of things to ensure that. We have development plans set up for our faculty, learners, and staff. Many of you may know about the R01 boot camp we have. We have the uh, Clinical Trials Academy to train the next generation of individuals who would like to do clinical trials. So we have fundamentally programs to address the development of our, uh, our faculty, uh, staff, and learners. The second one is that we want to create these ecosystems of communities. We want to commute these, uh, develop these communities of scholars. And I can tell you why. When we do exit interviews of individuals of faculty who have left this institution to go somewhere else, or we ask individuals and say, hey, I knew that you got a bank load of money thrown at you and you decided to stay here, why? It's not about the money often, it's about that community of collaborators that they built here over the years. And a lot of them have told me, Steve, I could go somewhere else, but it would take me my whole career to put back the team that I have here together. And we want to foster that, and I'll spend a fair amount of time because inflammation and immunology plays a central role in to continue to build these communities of scholars. Our third strategy is to look at how do we support the bold science, out-of-the-box, crazy experiments that NIH would never fund. Many of you who are NIH grant writers know that you probably need a bucket load of preliminary data and uh, address what I call safe science. Through an R01 mechanism, which is the coin of the realm, the NIH doesn't like to fund risky science. 
So I'll show you some of the programs that we stood up to help support bold science here at the University of Michigan. The fourth strategy is to look at our clinical research and clinical trials, and we want to make sure that we have a thousand bed hospital here and with our affiliates that we're here to help with the clinical research and the clinical trials to take those translational studies and put them into the clinic. And then the fifth is, although this strategic plan is really based on helping the people, we can't forget the infrastructure. Everything from our space to our cores to our IT efforts. So if we look at the first strategic plan, why? Well, we really need to make sure that we uh, safeguard the number one asset that we have here, and that's you all, our people. We can invest in all the bricks and mortars we want, but if we don't invest in you, it's going to come up short. We want to enable faculty, trainees, and our staff to thrive professionally, and we want them to remain competitive. The second collaboration is to create these communities of scholars, because we believe that tackling large programs is beyond the ability of a single lab to do this. We also believe that one of our differentiators is that we are one of the most collaborative, large academic medical centers probably in the country, that we kind of like each other, and we get along with each other, and we build a lot of multi-PI grants together. And we really want to create these scholarly networks to facilitate the engagement, and we are poised to respond to federal priorities. And I want to get just a little bit more granular on this second strategy that we have. Although we've continued to invest in cancer, cardiovascular, diabetes, and health outcomes, there are five areas that we believe that we can make strategic bets on. That's neuroscience. Uh, I just saw Ravi Alada here, who is our new executive director of the Michigan Neuroscience Institute. We are well poised to make a big run into neuroscience. We've had deep strengths here historically, and we want to continue that. We want to make investments in e-health, which is basically artificial intelligence, machine learning, and wearables. This is going to be a large part of our future, both at the clinical level and in our research. We want to make sure that we make investments in, in women, in children's uh, health through health equities. We have a big effort already in opioid and pain management. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to invest in there. Many of you may know that the state of Michigan over the next 10 to 15 years is likely to receive up to a billion dollars off of the opioid settlement. Not all of that's going to go to research, but we have a lot of expertise to help out with that. And then finally, a point that's near and dear to my heart, I've been studying inflammation uh, for a number of decades, that we want to start making investments in immunology and inflammation. And I had a talk with uh, uh, Dr. Holland this morning, and he basically said what we all know, that inflammation cuts that horizontal cut through all of the diseases. I don't think anyone can name a single disease that does not have an inflammatory component associated with it. And I'd just like to talk a little bit more detail about inflammation. The guiding principle of the immune response is about as simple as you can be. It has two mechanisms that allow us to survive. One, a very destructive response, that our immune response can respond to something that we call as foreign or non-self and destroy it. And it has to have the inability to mount a destructive response against ourself. But as we all know with a lot of things in science, the devil's in the details, and the immune system is probably one of the most complicated systems that there is. But I can give you Steve Kunkel's mind's eye of what I look at with regards to a destructive immune response, and it comes back from a, a sequence from a Lord of the Rings. So what you're going to see is Gandalf is the immune system, and the creature from the deep is an infectious disease, cancer cell, and the mantra is this. Because the immune system is designed to make sure that microbes and things that should not be in us are not. So I'd like to then continue. The third strategy we have is bold science. As I mentioned, the NIH traditionally funds more safe science. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on faculty to secure extramural funding as the pay lines get lower, so there's a, a dwindling pool of funds to help out bold science. And we've decided one thing that I'd just like to share with you, and some of you may know this because some of you in the audience are our scouts. And this was based on a, a system set up by a, a, a well-financed uh, individual, a, a philanthropist from uh, California, who set up a hypothesis network. He collected a, a, a group of well-known scientists. He gave them a bucket of airline tickets and a bank of money, and he said, go across the United States and find people doing out-of-the-box crazy science and invest in them. And we've done the same thing. We've identified 12 scouts. They range from assistant up to full professors. We gave them a little bit of money, $150,000. And he said, 
We ask them not to go fund their friends, but to find science that probably has some interesting preliminary data, but it dead ended there because there was no more funds to do that next set of experiments that they wanted to do. And we wanted to make sure that we found a mechanism to fund that bold science, that we could fund that out of the box, what if type of experiment. And I'm extremely excited about what these type of studies are going to show. The fourth strategy is predicated again on our clinical trials. We made some significant investments. We want to make sure that our thousand bed hospital, and especially with the new affiliates coming on board, that we are there to provide that help to support clinical research and clinical studies. And as I mentioned, we always want to make sure that we keep our eye on the infrastructure, our IT, our cores, and our space. And this all fits together with regards to making sure that we can recruit and retain those individuals, that we can set up these collaboratives, these uh, communities of scholars. We want to make sure that both basic, translational, and clinical studies are supported, wrapped up in both a mechanism to fund innovation and a mechanism to make sure that the infrastructure is here that you can all do successful science. So I'd now like to introduce our Dean and Executive uh, Vice President for Medical Affairs, uh, Dr. Marshall Rungi. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's great to see all you here today. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for, as Steve said, taking your time. And I, I can assure you, uh, once I'm finished speaking, it'll be worth the effort. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited about today's program. It's, uh, as Steve said, an inaugural program of these dean's lectures that we'll start having more often. Uh, and the intent is not just to showcase uh, excellent scientific research, uh, which, w which we will have with Dr. Steve Holland, but to celebrate our own research mission and uh, our innovative discoveries, which as Steve Kunkel showed, uh, are quite extensive. Uh, within our academic medical center, um, research has a really unique and critical role to advance medicine and health and to drive a greater understanding of disease, of disease treatment, and outcomes. And our research truly does span everything from the smallest entity, well below a molecule, to clinical studies and outcome studies uh, that impact uh, the health of people who live in Michigan and beyond. Uh, and we have a long history of this at the University of Michigan and of supporting our investigators. So it, should go, it goes without saying that we are so fortunate to have Steve Kunkel as our chief scientific officer. Uh, and uh, I get even more excited about science, which I'm always excited about, after hearing uh, Steve's vision, which I think has driven us in such a productive way and I think has been a benefit to how we really pull together to try to uh, advance health. Our, our, Motto is that we advance health for Michigan and the world, and uh, there's no more important part of that than what you all do. Um, I also uh, want to uh, thank both Steve, uh, but also his group for organizing everything today. Um, Aaron LaRoe, uh, Kelly Canali, David Madrigal, uh, all played an important role and are here today, and also our colleagues from communications uh, who are here to help uh, this program go forward. So, yeah, good. Big hand for all of them. And, you know, I, I, it's, it was the toughest of times for, uh, in many ways, but for research also during the pandemic, where labs had to be shut down and research completely started from scratch in many cases. Uh, but I'm so delighted and so energized and so proud of all of you for being where we are today, given those difficult couple of years. So at my... It's, at this time, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce a fellow scientist, fellow researcher, an immunologist. I can't say a fellow immunologist since I'm not an immunologist, uh, and the president of the University of Michigan, Dr. Santa Ono. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's really wonderful to be with you today. Um, this is going to be a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Holland. I just want to say a couple of, uh, of comments before uh, we move on to the science. First, uh, thank you, Marshall, uh, for that uh, very kind introduction and everything that you do as Executive Vice President. Um, and uh, Steve, 
thank you for your leadership. You know, from the very first day that I stepped on this campus and spoke uh, with the team, I've been very, very impressed with your strategy and investments. Uh, you can see uh, the impact of, of you as CSO uh, on uh, this university, but also uh, on uh, the medical school. So thank you for that. And for those of you who do not know, Dr. Steve Kunkel is in his own right one of the most highly cited immunologists in the world. Let's hear for Steve. We're also very, very uh, fortunate to have with us someone who's been here for a couple of years on our faculty at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and is the Chief Medical Executive for the State of Michigan, Natasha Bagdasarian, uh, who moved from Singapore just a couple of years ago from the WHO. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's hear from Natasha. And uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to someone uh, who has made uh, numerous uh, contributions to the University of Michigan. Um, he's my predecessor as president of the University of Michigan. This is the second time we've been together at the same institution. It was about 30 years ago. You preceded me from Dave Baltimore's lab to Hopkins, and I remember very vividly when I gave my job talk that you were there with Drew Pardol and Bob Silicano and Steve Desiderio and uh, Doug Fearon, I think. And uh, so, um, Mark, thank you for everything that you've done for the University of Michigan. Let's hear it from Mark Slissel. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here uh, for this dean's lecture. This is exactly what should happen at universities, uh, great minds, uh, greater discoveries. And, and there are lots of great minds here, uh, so many great discoveries from the past, but also for the present and the future that are made possible by this strategic vision and plan and investments that are being made. Uh, it's really exciting. I don't know if uh, Ravi Alad is still here. Is Ravi, are you still here? Let's hear for Ravi, who moved from Northwestern to head the Michigan Neuroscience Institute. Welcome back home. I can't wait to sit down with you and see how we can be supportive of everything that you're going to do uh, to build upon the great neuroscience research that's happening already at this institution. I know scattered around the institution, but uh, we're thrilled to have you uh, back here at the University of Michigan. Um, so uh, the actual main course of today is uh, Dr. Steve Holland's talk. And I've been asked to uh, give some comments about his uh, very distinguished history as an immunologist. Some of you may know that Dr. Steve Holland is the director of the Intramural Research Program and chief of uh, the immunopathogenesis section at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He received his MD from Johns Hopkins University. It seems like a lot of us went there. Um, and uh, in 1983, where he uh, stayed as a resident in internal medicine, assistant chief of service in medicine and fellow in infectious diseases. And he moved to the NIH in 89 uh, as a National Research Council fellow in the Laboratory of Molecular Microbiology, working on the transcriptional regulation of HIV. In 91, he joined the Laboratory of Host Defenses, shifting his research to the host side with a focus on phagocyte uh, defects and their associated infections. His work centered on the pathogenesis and management of chronic granulomatous uh, disease, as well as other congenital immune defects affecting phagocytes, including those predisposing to microbacterial diseases. Uh, he is the chief of LCID, LCID from 2004 to 2016 and was selected as uh, director in 2016. The immunopathogenesis section, therapeutic, and research programs that he leads takes a fully integrated approach to infectious disease, incorporating the molecular genetics of the host and pathogen, as well as mechanisms of pathogenesis that allow the development and study of novel therapeutics. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give Dr. Steve Holland a warm welcome to the University of Michigan. Oh, wow. It is uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, not only at such an estimable institution, but with so many great friends. And um, that's the beauty of being back in person. I, I mean, I, Zoom was fine, right? It was great. Uh, no. It's really great to be back with other humans, sharing the kinds of things that make 
human intercourse so exhilarating and so synergistic. We do things together and that makes us better. And um, I knew that about Michigan before I came here, but I really know it now having heard um, from so many of your senior leadership. I also know that what makes senior leadership good is the people that are here doing the actual work. No offense, uh, but I know that in my own job as well. And uh, I know what goes on here, and I know it's extraordinary. So it's a real honor and a pleasure. I want to say at the start, I am not an immunologist. I don't even play one on TV. I am a straight, card-carrying, infectious disease doctor. But what I know is that nobody gets an infection, you know, Hogwarts uh, uh, separately, nobody gets an infection unless the immune system screws up. And trying to understand that is what I am all about. And so I'm going to tell you a story around um, something that we came across unexpectedly just by being there and by trying to watch, trying to read those uh, different tea leaves. So let me say at the start, I come from the National Institutes of Health. So uh, you may know us as a uh, financial distribution center uh, or as a financial distribution uh, negator. Uh, I'm sorry for, for either one of those. Uh, I am there as an intramural investigator. This is a picture of Building 10. Um, it's a small hospital, only about 200 beds, and we don't always fill all of them. But what makes it distinct is that on the wings of either side of that one core are our laboratories. And right behind the whole building are other laboratories. So I walk one minute from my office to my clinic and three minutes from my office to my inpatient unit. And patients and samples and doctors and studies are constantly going back and forth every single day. And that integration is what I think makes um, part of our work so special. We do have opportunities. Uh, am I poaching here? Yeah. So we do have opportunities for fellows, for residents, for postdocs, for students. And if you have questions about those, please um, reach out to me. I really would like to be able to tell you about some of the things we do. Because frankly, your tax dollars have funded it. You might as well take full advantage of it. Now, I want to just set the stage here for a moment. This is um, a graph of world population. It extends back to, you know, a few years ago. Now, you might say, Steve, how do you know that? How do you know what was going on in 500 BC? Well, I, I asked Marshall. Uh, he said, you know, I remember. But the, the fact is, if you look at this graph and say, okay, where were antibiotics introduced? And which one was it that started it out? It's hard to tell. And in fact, antibiotics were only introduced in the last 100 years. And yet, despite that, as a species, we have been increasing, despite the fact that we've not been able to treat most of the infectious diseases that we think of as scourges. And that's a reminder that there are tremendous built-in um, uh, mechanisms to prevent infections from being fatal. They don't work all the time. Nothing does. But they're important. So I'll just remind you that antibiotics only came in in 1909 with the introduction of salversan, which was developed for the treatment of uh, what was then called sleeping sickness, the, the disease in Africa. It wasn't very good for that. It turned out to be more useful for that other sleeping sickness known as syphilis. But it was 23 years between that and the introduction of sulfa drugs, and another nine years before the introduction of penicillin. And anti-tuberculous therapy didn't come in until 60 years ago. So the introduction of antibiotics is relatively recent. And although it's been extraordinary, we had all the mechanisms in place to do many of the things that we use antibiotics to support. So if you're interested in this topic, I recommend this book um, with great enthusiasm. I get no residual for saying it, but The Demon Under the Microscope, um, it's an absolutely terrific read, as are uh, all the books by this particular author. I really would, would encourage you. But our question, and I think every investigator, every clinician's question, is why do people get sick? What makes that 
happen? How do we go from being great one day and at death's door the next? And so one of the things I just want to remind you, and I'm speaking here to people that are, are creating programs as well as to clinicians. You know, if you look at the rate of tuberculosis in the United States right now, not worldwide, worldwide it's huge. In the United States, we have 2.7 cases of tuberculosis per 100,000 people. And that's a number that's going down. Well over 50% of those cases are in people who were born abroad, where they had poor access to care and treatment for tuberculosis. 2.7 per 100,000. And yet, every one of you, I suspect, has been screened at least once for tuberculosis. And if you're a physician, you have spent a lot of time thinking about doing that. In contrast to that rate, the rate of primary immune deficiency in the United States, now we're talking about a prevalence versus an incidence, I understand those are different, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the prevalence rate of an immune deficiency is somewhere between two and three times as high as the number of cases of tuberculosis. So I'd say to you as a physician, if you have ever stopped and wondered, could that guy have TB? If you didn't think at least that one time, could that person also have an underlying immune defect, you've been missing out. Don't do that. And I'll show you why. So, why are the rates of immune deficiency going up? It's because the science is so much better. And this is a graph you see here, um, looking at the top is 1980, at the bottom is uh, 2021. I haven't even put 2022 on there. This is the number of identified molecular and functional primary immune deficiencies. And you know, why is that? Well, you can see the graph above that is the, the cost of getting a whole exome or a whole genome sequence. The cost has fallen to down below $1,000. It's ridiculously inexpensive. And compared to many of the other tests that people do day in and day out that are not only um, not diagnostic but not very accurate um, and very expensive, the genetics is really driving this uh, recognition. But the other thing that's happening is not just the recognition of germline defects, it's the recognition uh, on the left-hand uh, slide of um, somatic mutations. I'm not going to talk about those. The oncologists have that all covered. But I'm going to talk about those things that are phenocopies of underlying genetic defects caused by um, autoantibodies. So I'm going to talk about four autoantibodies uh, today. In the third hour, I'll talk about uh, discussion points. But so we're going to talk about anti-interferon gamma, anti-IL-23, anti-GMCSF, and anti-interferon alpha. And honest to God, you should be thinking about those. If you're out there thinking, what causes disease? What modulates disease? These are important. All right, so let me start my first story. 1882, 140 years ago, Robert Koch identifies under his microscope, in his home, what he believes is the cause of tuberculosis. So what's he do? He publishes, but in the way that you did back then. He invites all of his friends over, and he says, come over to my house, and I'll show you the cause of tuberculosis. So he sets up the microscope in his kitchen and um, says, you can come take a look. And um, what do they say? They say, uh, no, that cannot be the case. TB, that's a bad disease. These are itty bitty things. They're under the microscope. And so that is where you had to go for years until they developed what's called Cox postulates, which are the criteria by which we say, oh, yeah, I really believe it. And the other thing they said is, yuck, I'm not having dinner with this guy again. Are you kidding? But what he identified was mycobacterium tuberculosis. And over the next 140 years, we've identified hundreds more species of mycobacteria. And what you see here, M. tuberculosis is at the top of that pyramid of virulence. And then down from that are all of these other organisms. So um, the ones that are below that, that I've highlighted here in yellow, are referred to collectively as the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And these are things that, in general, are thought to be not a big deal, unless you have a problem. And so in the 1990s, when HIV was still not controlled, we knew that people who got disseminated mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, were people who had very advanced HIV. And so what my laboratory and others did around that time is said, well, let's go and look 
at people who don't have HIV, who don't have a competing explanation for getting that, and try and figure out other underlying genetic causes. And um, I won't go into detail about this, but there are different manifestations of these infections. There's, you know, skin disease, there's lung disease. I'm not going to talk about those. I'm only going to talk about disseminated disease. And as is true for most things in science, we know the most about the most extreme problem, which also happens to be the least common. But that's the way it is. We pick out those things that are most um, uh, highly contrasted to the background, and we focus on those until we learn enough to go forward. So what do we know after now uh, about 30 years of study of these things? So there's one major pathway that controls disseminated mycobacterial disease. Again, I'm not talking about skin disease. I'm not talking about lung disease. Those are fundamentally different. Don't confuse them here. But disseminated disease, it's all controlled in one basic way. So mycobacteria, you see there as the little red things, the, the red organisms that are inside the macrophage on the bottom. Those organisms lead to the production of IL-12 by the macrophage and IL-23. Those activate the T cell and the NK cell to produce interferon gamma that then acts on its receptor, which is present on all nucleated cells, and that leads to the production of things like tumor necrosis factor, fever, weight loss, as well as a whole variety of intracellular activations through STAT1 and downstream mediators, leading to the killing of mycobacteria inside the cell. Despite 140 years of study, we still do not know what the last thing M. tuberculosis sees is before it dies. Boy, would I like to know that. That would make a huge difference. We don't know what is it that finally executes the killing. But we do know that this is the pathway. And we know that because we've got monogenic defects in all of these genes that are associated with developing disseminated non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. Typically with BCG, if you're in one of those countries that gives BCG vaccination, otherwise known as the International Immunodeficiency Challenge Test, if you get BCG vaccine on day one of life, it often disseminates and you get very sick. And so we pick out those monogenic defects. But if you're not in one of those places, they often present differently. These are often referred to as Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. And although that's a wonderful name and it really rolls right off the tongue, remember that this compartment inside the macrophage is not dedicated to the control of mycobacteria, but in fact, controls all sorts of other things. And as you see here, it's got salmonella, Burkholderia, gram-negative rods, listeria, gram-positive, and then fungi, Tauromyces, histo, coxi, as well as some viruses. So we're talking about a major pathway that controls the response to a whole host of pathogens. And that pathway we identify because of certain infections. Okay, now, I am an internal medicine uh, doc and um, most of these pathways show up in infancy because of the vaccines, because children are getting their first exposure. So now I ask you as um, you know, investigators to help me because this woman came to me um, you know, in the early part of this millennium and um, a 60-year-old woman from Vietnam who had been in the United States since the 1970s, had grown up during the Vietnam War, came out on a boat lift, um, had loads of stresses in refugee camps, and was fine. Had a family, had a job, did beautifully well, and then at age 59, started to lose weight and get sick. And you can see those spots on her chest, and down below that you see the bones that are um, infected with Mycobacterium avium. And here is infection that is rupturing out through her skin. So why would this happen to her? She got a, had a disease that was just like a child who was missing one of those receptors, and yet she wasn't a child. And I'm not saying 60's old, but it ain't six weeks. And so we looked, and the question was, where could the lesion be? And it was in none of those places that um, we knew about it. So our issue was it looks like a genetic disease, it's acting like a genetic disease, but it's coming on late in life. And when we took her cells out and we isolated them and stimulated them, they behave just like anybody else's cells. So we were trying to figure out what could be causing this, and it became clear that this was being caused by an autoantibody 
against interferon gamma itself that was such a potent antibody that it completely neutralized interferon gamma activity and mimicked completely the effect of having no receptor. Well, around that time, um, there were other groups that identified the same phenomenon. And um, what was interesting about that was you see in the very first paper, it was reported in a 25-year-old Thai woman living in Germany who had disseminated a non-tuberculous disease and disseminated Burkholderia gladioli. Keep that Burkholderia gladioli in mind, it'll come back later. And then there was another case of a 57-year-old Filipino man living in the United Kingdom. And then uh, at the bottom, there were six women, all native to Southeast Asia, identified in the United States that we had seen ourselves, including the woman whose picture I saw you. And so we started to, to think, well, wait a minute. If this is really all being reported in people from Southeast Asia, whether they're in the US or in the UK or in Germany, what is going on? And so we thought, you know, if this is happening outside of Southeast Asia, what's happening inside Southeast Asia? We're missing a piece of the puzzle. And so I was very lucky at that time. One of the, the, the um, uh, positive consequences of the altruism that um, we all engage in when we say, yes, I'll review a paper for a journal, and then you actually do it. Um, this paper was from Plonchan Chachoksat, who was a Thai investigator who had identified 59 HIV uninfected adults in Thailand who had all of those infections that I show there. Salmonella, cryptococcus, you know, so uh, fungi, bacteria, and um, some viruses with herpes zoster. And I looked at this paper and I said, wow, that's just like what we're seeing. And so I reached out to her and said, could we please come and work with you to study your population of patients to see if it's the same as our population. And so um, Sarah Brown, who was then a fellow in the lab, uh, put together this study. And I'm only going to briefly talk about method here for a second to say that we wanted a prospective trial. Finding things retrospectively is always exciting, but it's not quite as persuasive to the world as finding it prospectively. But when you ask prospectively, you can't just ask a single question. You've got to ask a bunch. And so Sarah put together five groups of patients those who had non-tuberculous disease that was disseminated, those that had um, either disseminated non-tuberculous disease or other opportunistic infections, those who had disseminated tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, or blood bank donors. And the method we decided to use was working with this guy named Peter Burbello, who developed something called the LIPS assay. Now, you see that he's not showing you his. And um, the LIPS assay is luciferase immunoprecipitation system, where you take your target, whatever it is, you fuse it to luciferase, you put it into a plasmid, you stick it into a cell, and that cell synthesizes the protein of interest, now fused to luciferase, you just come in with an antibody, pull that antibody out, and suddenly you've got an antibody that glows, and you can measure as light units um, what you found. And what you see here, is that only the patients who had disseminated disease or other opportunistic infections had high titers of antibody, and these were only the antibodies to interfere on gamma. But you see, those patients who had disseminated tuberculosis or pulmonary tuberculosis didn't have that. And what I've just listed here, the other opportunistic infections, were exactly the same as the group that Plonchan had described previously, and exactly the same as the group that I mentioned to you that people who have mutations in the receptors have. So what does that look like? Only one um, a picture here. Um, on the left is a man who had uh, disseminated Teleromyces marnefii as well as disseminated Mycobacterium fortuitum. You can see it's um, really all over uh, his body. On the right, you see a woman who had um, isolated Salmonella lymphadenitis. So these antibodies to interfere on gamma mimic that condition called uh, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. But why do they happen? What in the world could be going on that would make that happen? And why should it be happening only in Southeast Asia? We saw no reports of this from Africa, no reports from the United States, no reports from people born anywhere but in Southeast Asia. So um, uh, 
Chun Lung Kyu and his coworkers in Taiwan, where there's also a, a cluster of these cases, started to look and they said, gee, maybe that's an HLA association. HLA is a very ethnically associated uh, antibody, uh, 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 ethnically associated uh, gene complex, and it drives the response to antigen and therefore drives the production of antibody. And so what they did was to look through all of the HLA uh, associations in their population, and they found two that are shown there in stars. I won't uh, go through what they are, but they said, wow, why should that be so interesting? And it turns out the reason is that those HLA alleles confer recognition to a particular peptide, which happens to be the terminal 10 amino acids of interferon gamma, as you see there. And that's interesting because the terminal 10 amino, ac 10 amino acids of interferon gamma overlap with a, ser a series of 10 amino acids in a gene in aspergillus. It happens to be aspergillus terius here, um, one of the non-pathogenic aspergillus strains, but it's a virtually identical association. And they said, wow, isn't that interesting? Here there might be an exposure to something from aspergillus that then is leading to the production of antibody to um, interferon. And in fact, their hypothesis, which I think has a lot of merit, is that you would get exposed to aspergillus, as you see there in frame A. That would lead to production against the aspergillus peptide, called NOC2. That antibody to NOC2 would cross-react with interferon gamma and then would neutralize your ability to respond to interferon gamma. And one of the ways that they helped to prove that this was an, a reasonable hypothesis was that they could erase the epitope in interferon gamma that coincided to NOC2 and they could restore function. So why do you care? It's not just about figuring out um, what the cause is, fascinating though that is. It's because once you have an idea what the cause is, you can think about what the treatment might be. And once you know that it's antibody mediated, then there are lots of ways to go after antibodies. One shown here is the use of rituximab. This is an off-label use. And um, rituximab actually uh, is able to uh, kill uh, B cells. And what you see here is that the titer on the left, pre-RTX, is starting titers. Um, as we treat patients, their titers fall. That one that says relapse, we'd stopped treating this patient after several months, the woman that I showed you at the beginning. After we depleted her B cells, we let them come back. After they came back, her titers came up. She got sick again. We treated her again, and she got better. So we could eliminate the antibody, and if we did that, we eliminated their disease. But as is true with so many things, you can't always eliminate it. And so in this particular patient, um, we were not able to deplete her antibody with uh, rituximab, implying that her problem was in now plasma cells. So we had to use a treatment that was directed at plasma cells. In this case, it was uh, bortezomib. Um, and you can see that we were able to dramatically reduce the uh, inhibitory capacity of her plasma. And that allowed, um, in the different frames at the bottom there, to have her completely uh, destroy the infection that she had. So reducing the antibody um, was successful. Some of you may know bortezomib is not always easy to take, and in a patient that we had that neither responded to rituximab nor could tolerate bortezomib, we went on to the drug called uh, daratumumab, which is another direct plasma cell deple depleting agent, which was um, capable of taking those big abscesses you see there on the lower left and um, re resolving them uh, completely. So you identify the cause in order to figure out um, can you... Um, can you treat it more effectively? There is one easy way to look for these antibodies. Um, the simplest way is to send me an email. Um, we do it for free. Uh, the slightly more complicated way, there are commercial sources out there that also do a perfectly good job. But then you also have already in hand this technique called the quantiferon uh, assay, which is used in most institutions really around the world, not all, um, but it works by detecting interferon gamma elaboration in the supernatant of blood that is collected. And what you see here is that um, there are antigen tubes and mitogen tubes. The um, antigen tubes tell you whether it's TB is present, but the mitogen tube tells you whether your cells are alive. And so in the mitogen tube, you need to make interferon gamma to have the assay be reliable. And in patients who have the 
autoantibody to interfere on gamma. It blocks the ability to interact in the saliza. And so those patients have zero values in the mitogen tube, and it's called indeterminate. So if you have a sample of a quantiferon that's indeterminate, think about whether it could be due to an autoantibody. Finally, um, you know, we all start out with a certain series of um, germline uh, genes, and um, those get selected, and then they get refined uh, in this uh, process of uh, somatic hypermutation and affinity maturation. And over the course of disease, even patients with these autoantibodies uh, change and uh, augment the profile of their antibodies. And um, schematically, what uh, the, the uh, Q group has also shown is that there are really different, eventually there are different um, phenotypes of antibodies, some that recognize the antigen itself in group one, um, those that identify the antigen on the receptor in group two, and then some that even target uh, the receptors themselves that make for uh, difficulty with um, response. So I've tried to tell you a little bit about these autoantibodies to interfere on gamma that cause a remarkable disease that you need to think about if you're seeing patients who have disseminated uh, disease in this country or any other country, especially if they have their origin in Southeast Asia. Fascinatingly, it's about people mostly who were born in Southeast Asia and then come here. I've shown you they can get disease in Southeast Asia. They can get disease if they were born in Southeast Asia. For the vast majority of people from Southeast Asia who were born in this country or outside of Southeast Asia, it doesn't happen. And the other fascinating thing is that when you're in Southeast Asia, it's about 60-40 women to men. Once people leave Southeast Asia, it's 90% women and only 10% men. So here's a fascinating disease that is genetically based around HLA, but it's gender skewed, especially when you change the geography behind it. I think all of us are interested in gene environment interactions, and here's a staggeringly powerful one that I don't understand. Whether that's microbiome, whether that is pollution, I, I don't know. There are lots of different um, things. I don't think it's political, but I come from Washington. So, so these fascinating things um, really are important to diagnose, and there are important possibilities in terms of treatment. OK, so like in most gambling, it is the intermittent reinforcement that is the most dangerous, that makes you keep on wondering what comes next. And so when we met a patient a few years later who had four years of blood cultures positive for Burkholderia gladioli, despite having been on intravenous therapy, there was no question about whether our antibiotics were good. I know how to give antibiotics. But she didn't clear up no matter what we did. And so we looked to see what was happening, and we identified that she had a binding activity against IL-12. And we thought, oh, that makes good sense. That IL-12, it fits with our paradigm. It must be the right answer. But you know, um, this is where having young people come into the lab is painful, occasionally humiliating, and always educational. And uh, Aristine Chang came in and said, uh, no, really, I don't believe this. Because by the time she came in, it had been years since we had reported that case, and no one had come up with another case. She said, this, this doesn't seem likely. I think these antibodies, it turns out these antibodies are common. Anti-IL-12 antibodies are common in thymoma. And the thymoma patients with the IL-12 antibodies alone weren't getting this. So she said, there must be something else. And in fact, what Aristine hypothesized is that it wasn't the IL-12 neutralization that was important, it was the IL-23. And this drawing here is to remind you that IL-12 and IL-23 share components of their own, of the same receptor, IL-12 receptor beta-1, as well as um, different moieties inside, IL-12 uh, P40. And she said, you know, I don't think it's the IL-12 neutralization that's important, I bet it could be the IL-23. And so she set about trying to prove this, and she was absolutely correct. I had um, been too easily distracted by finding what I thought I was looking for. And what Aristine noticed was that in this patient who had the IL-12 problem, she also had an IL-23 problem. 
and that what we were doing was um, she was unable to activate um, IL-23 mediated responses. Well, you might say, well, why, you know, why do I care about IL-23 mediated responses? Because IL-23 is required to generate the mate cells, the mucosally associated invariant T cells that produce interferon gamma and lead to the um, stimulation of macrophages and killing of intracellular organisms. And what you see there on the bottom right is that this patient who had antibodies to IL-23 could not produce interferon gamma in those cells because she was blocking the IL-23 activity. Well, is that important in more than that one case? And, and this is where it really got um, so interesting. In fact, it turns out to be very important outside that case. And um, not only there on the middle is the patient with the disseminated Burkholderia gladioli I mentioned to you, but there down below is a patient who had um, brain infection with Cladophyllophora bantiana, um, one of the tongue twisters that's particularly dangerous to um, even people with, quote, normal immune systems that is not known to be associated with disease. And this woman, um, who happened also to be from the Philippines, um, had a deep-seated brain infection that we were able to uh, eradicate, working with Mahal uh, Leonakis, who's a, a gifted uh, antifungal investigator. And then another patient here who had um, brain infection with M. avium complex in the setting of HIV, but it was well-controlled HIV, and he had antibodies to this as well. What you also see that I think is sort of striking is that in thymoma, that group that has very high titer, there are an enormous number of people who are sick. And when we worked with um, uh, a group at University of Indiana, Pat Lohrer, who has um, hundreds of patients with thymoma, what we identified was that the ones who had the anti-IL-23 were the ones who were getting opportunistic infections. And those who didn't get opportunistic infections didn't have it or had only the anti-IL-12. So that ability to dissect out the difference between 12 and 23 and identify those who are getting in trouble because of their antibodies um, really was quite exciting. So this autoantibody against IL-23 also mediates susceptibility to a broad-based array of uh, antifungal, uh, of uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, capacities. So these antibodies, like the anti-interferon gamma, um, mycobacteria, bacteria, fungi, and viruses, um, they neutralize always IL-23, sometimes IL-12, and they're often associated with other uh, autoantibodies, including those against lung parenchyma and uh, against some of the um, other uh, autoimmune targets that we're familiar with from other diseases. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with that pathway and uh, move on and, and try and wake you up here uh, in the second half. And the food's still coming, so don't, don't worry about that. So when we looked broadly in our LIPS assay in, um, in, in Thailand, we used 41 different targets because we thought, you know, if we only asked the interferon gamma question, that would be good. But we want to make sure we're thinking more broadly than that. And you see here, this one person had disseminated cryptococcal disease. You see that large mass on his right lung eroding into his um, spine and invading into his central nervous system. That guy did not have antibodies to interfere on gamma, but he clearly had something. And what he had were autoantibodies to GMCSF. And GMCSF is really a um, polytropic uh, a cytokine. It's produced by a variety of cells, and it activates a variety of cells. And um, it's got loads of activities. Now, if you're um, interested in what GMCSS GMCSF does um, in general. You might remember the mouse studies when the receptor was first knocked out, and those mice got osteopetrosis. Oh, so GMCSF is involved in that. And then they also had alveolar proteinosis. Oh, so GMCSF is involved in that, as well as the production of myeloid cells. In the human context, autoantibodies to GMCSF have been recognized for over 30 years, and those antibodies cause pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which you see here, sometimes referred to as a crazy paving pattern. If you think of French streets uh, and how the, the blocks are, are uh, spread out there, the crazy paving pattern is characteristic of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And what you see there down on the bottom 
is that in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, the macrophages can ingest lipids in the airway and lipids in the uh, alveoli, but they can't digest them. And so they, they blow up like, um, I think, Veruca salt in the uh, old uh, Willy Wonka movies, and then they just sort of sit there and do nothing. And um, that's what it looks like. You get these cholesterol clefts on uh, pathology. So that's what people thought GMCSF antibodies were doing. And yet we were finding it with cryptococcus. So we went back and said, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe we missed something here along the way. And so we went back to getting a large assembly of cryptococcal meningitis samples from Jack Bennett, uh, a senior investigator at the NIH. And as we went through his backlog of C uh, CSF samples, we found that about 10% of cases with cryptococcal meningitis had autoantibodies to GMCSF. But it wasn't just cryptococcus. It was almost exclusively cryptococcus gadii. Now, for those of you who actually have lives, I'm going to remind you that cryptococcus gadii is the immunocompetent cryptococcus, whereas cryptococcus neoformans is the immunodeficient cryptococcus. So here we were finding these autoantibodies to GMCSF almost exclusively in people who had what had been called you know, that cryptococcal disease that invades your brain in people who are otherwise healthy, because they're not really otherwise healthy. And then, you know, again, it's that intermittent reinforcement that really gets you hooked. We started looking for this elsewhere, and I got a call about a, a former uh, Marine who had been driving through the uh, back roads of Virginia when his car ran into a phone pole, and they brought him in, and they scanned his head. He probably had passed out uh, at the wheel. And they saw this. And you see that hole there on the left side? That's really not normal. And um, they called in a neurosurgeon. And so for any of you who are infectious disease consultants, you will not believe me when I tell you that the neurosurgeon cultured the fluid. Um, but it happened. I'm sure it was an accident. And it grew nocardia. And they said, well, nocardia. That does not cause brain disease, typically, except in profoundly immunocompromised people. What's going on here? And they eventually referred him to us, and we uh, did all the work to show that he, too, had autoantibodies to GMCSF, and, in fact, that these autoantibodies to GMCSF block the um, autocrine signaling that occurs in macrophages when they're infected with these organisms. And then we reached out to colleagues around the world and identified that there were, in fact, many cases of autoantibodies to GMCSF in patients who had disseminated nocardiosis. So these antibodies to GMCSF turn out to be surprisingly more common than you think. And I know how often you've looked for them, so um, I'm telling you it's going to be more often than you thought. But they cause not only pulmonary disease, interestingly enough, people that with the infections, they typically show up with the infection, and then they go on to develop the lung disease later. That tells you that there's a duration of inhibition that must occur in order for things to um, show up. I'll just say one last thing about that. This gentleman was in the military, and so he had had blood banked for about 20 years by the time we met him. And what we were able to go back and show was that he had had this antibody at the same level present for 10 years before he developed his brain disease, and another five years before he developed his lung disease. So there's something about time and about uh, exposure that makes a difference. So fascinating diseases. Finally, I'm going to conclude um, on uh, the topic that has uh, upended and preoccupied our lives for the last several years. And that's um, just a moment on COVID. Uh, I suspect you've all heard a lot about this already since COVID has been the only topic that anybody talked about for the last several years. So I'm going to take the privilege of not talking about it in detail, but just remind you that it turns out this is important here as well. So um, in work that was spearheaded by Helen Sue and Jean-Laurent Casanova and facilitated by Gigi Notarangelo at the NIH, um, we looked at patients from Italy who had severe lung disease, or severe disease from COVID, uh, winding up in the ICU, ventilated, or dying. And um, there were two important take-homes from that. 
Number one, they identified about 3.5% of adults with severe COVID had underlying monogenic problems, that is, mutations in the genes that either respond to viruses or recognize viruses or respond to interferon. Okay. Interferon is important. In interferon alpha, this is, the antiviral interferon, mostly interferon alpha and interferon omega, the type 1 interferons, as opposed to interferon gamma, which is a type 2 interferon. The type 1 interferons are essential for response to viruses. And 3.5% of those adults that had otherwise been thought to be healthy had mutations in those pathways. Even more interesting, almost three times as many had neutralizing autoantibodies against interferon alpha and omega, as you see there in the upper right. And those autoantibodies um, were um, able to fully neutralize the response to um, these type 1 interferons, type uh, interferon alpha or interferon omega. So these people had been walking around doing fine until they got COVID. It's not that they hadn't gotten other viral infections. And yet these an antibodies were there waiting for COVID to come along. Now there are some other viruses that are involved in that. I'll mention one in just a moment. But I want to say it's hard to know what's really going on. We don't have access to people before they get sick, but we do have access to them after they get sick. And so what you see here is in the red line, you see that the red line, it starts out high and it goes low. These are the activities of these anti-interferon alpha autoantibodies after people have shown up with COVID. And what you see is that these antibodies are largely going down to undetectable levels in those patients within a few months of their disease, making it unclear how much infection induces those antibodies, and then what is it that leads to their disappearance. In the blue up there, the blue lines are people who had underlying genetic disorders that lead to the production of those antibodies all the time. The red are the people that had episodic disease. We don't really know how high they'd been before they got sick. Finally, COVID is not just an exploiter of susceptibility, it's a driver of susceptibility. And in, I think, some really beautiful work uh, out of uh, UCSF by uh, PJ Utz's lab, he looked at the development of autoantibodies in people who had COVID. And I'm not going to go through each line of this uh, unless you um, really insist, and I'm betting you won't. But what you see there is on the top panel, they develop those, all the red boxes are autoantibodies to different targets. And what are those targets? In the two big columns on the right, they are interleukins and other cytokines. So people who got COVID-19 developed a lot of antibodies against m numerous immunologic targets as a consequence, or I should say as a concomitant of infection. And then PJ did the right thing, which was to say, okay, that's what happens with COVID. Is that COVID specific? And in fact, it's not. And if you looked at people who had other things that got them equally ill and got them into equally dire straits, they too had the development of these um, uh, autoantibodies. You see there are interferons and interleukins at the very top. And um, on the right are people who wound up in the ICU, and on the left are people who didn't. Now just to make that example concrete, and this is my last bit, 40-year-old man um, doing well in life, wants to go on safari. And um, so he goes to get his yellow fever vaccine. And um, one week after that, um, he goes back into the emergency room and says, guys, I have yellow fever. And I said, uh, no, you don't have yellow fever. We don't have yellow fever in this country. He said, no, no, you gave me the vaccine. It's an attenuated virus. I think I have yellow fever. And in fact, he did. He had vaccine-associated yellow fever virus. And they stopped and said, well, why should that be? And in the process, they saw that he had a thymoma. And you see there on the right, um, he's got, that's his chest x-ray. Uh, that's not two hearts. Marshall explained that to me. Um, this is really, he's got a thymoma on the right and a heart on the left, just like he's supposed to. And you see on that CT scan, that big mass there, that's a thymoma. It was not malignant. They cut it out. He did fine. He went on safari. He had a wonderful time. But 20 months later, he had COVID.
And after the COVID, he began to get a little different. His mood changed, his mentation changed. He had been a high, um, a high activity uh, cardiologist. And um, over time, he got referred to multiple centers and it wasn't until we finally did a brain biopsy and stained that for yellow fever virus that we found that his brain was chock full of vaccine strain yellow fever virus. Why? Because he had high level autoantibodies to interferon alpha in his blood and his CSF that blocked his ability to control this virus. This has been reported in other patients, typically those with thymoma. And what I don't know is whether it was the um, COVID infection that reactivated those um, anti-interferon alpha antibodies or they'd been there all along. They could have been either one in the setting of thymoma. But this progressive destructive brain disease with a virus that needs interferon alpha to be controlled turned out to be fatal. So I've tried over the last um, too long, I'm sure, to tell you about four different autoantibodies that are really important because they're out there, they're causing disease, and I know we're not looking for them. Not only do they cause disease, they modify the diseases we think we understand. So every time you're doing a drug trial and you say, I want to modulate this immune response, if you don't know what the background is in which these antibodies might be present, it's hard to tell. When we've looked in lupus, it makes a big difference in the severity of lupus and in how people respond to different interventions. So I've shown you just a small tip of a large iceberg of um, these autoantibodies against IL-23, interferon gamma, GMCSF, and interferon alpha and omega. I promise those aren't the only ones, and there are many others that have been described that no one has really um, been able to um, get to uh, the level of generating broad interest. But when you think about all the autoantibodies that we check, GAD65, you know, uh, double-stranded DNA, all the antibodies that are simply risk factors, these have the risk of being causal, and I encourage you to think hard about them. So they mimic Mendelian defects. Anytime you see somebody who looks like they ought to have a genetic problem and they don't, or they're so old that you don't think that genetics apply. You know, nobody thinks genetics apply after age 30, maybe every age 10. I don't know who you are and how you think about it, but these things are important, and these autoantibodies are out there. So anti-interferon gamma IL-23, uh, multiple opportunistic infections, GMCSF, lung disease, as well as some infections, and then uh, anti-interferon alpha and omega, um, uh, multiple uh, aspects of viral susceptibility. There are a lot of remaining questions. Why does this happen? Why does it happen to some people more than others? What are the triggers? How long do these last? Are they there forever? Um, some are, some aren't. Um, does it really help to get rid of them? In the case of anti-interferon gamma, absolutely. In the case of GMCSF, not so clear. In the others, we just don't know. And then, um, why do different diseases have different patterns? I don't know. And I hope that um, if I ever get invited back here, I will have something useful to tell you. So these are acquired, um, they are innate and adaptive immune defects, they are dynamic, they can have on-target and off-target effects, and some of them at least uh, can be treated. And they probably affect many more diseases than we think. I just want to stop and acknowledge the people uh, that have really done the work here, uh, in particular in my own uh, laboratory, uh, Lindsay Rosen, Krista Zerbe, and Sarah Brown, uh, as well as our collaborators um, around the, the NIH uh, and around the world. Uh, who have been really essential. It's, it's collaborative, and I think listening to people talk about what the University of Michigan environment uh, is all about, boy, that idea of collaboration, integration, synergistic association, that resonates. As a field, we cannot survive without it. And as a community, it is what makes it exhilarating to be uh, part of the team. So I'll stop there and say thank you very much.
No, no, I didn't say. So the question is, um, Aspergillus terius, what the heck's going on there? And that's a really important question. So there's a caveat to their story. And um, the caveat is that when we looked for um, when we looked for auto, when we looked for immune response to fungi, and there's you know, there's a lot of um, work out there looking at what are the different antigens in Aspergillus. I mean, all the the fungal allergy stuff, and we really couldn't find it. We couldn't find any evidence that these people had been infected with Aspergillus. So that's one small level of skepticism, but it raises the other possibility that what's really going on is that, um, for instance, you know, why would it be regional? Why would it be people born there and grown up there for a while and then moved away? So one possibility would be, say, aspergillus infection of foodstuffs, um, which is well known to occur in other settings. You know, could they then have ingested cooked or, or damaged aspergillus so that only one peptide led to an exposure? I, I mean, Terius happens to have the perfect match, but some of the other aspergilli um, also have a NOC2 gene that's got a couple of variants on the end. So I'm not wed to one uh, explanation there. I think the general, the general point that there is the opportunity for molecular mimicry is what um, I'm most taken with. And the fact that we can find a potential target in a, um, you know, a different uh, kingdom I think is at least attractive and worthy of um, further look. We've not gone back to foodstuffs, for instance, to say you know what's going on. When we went in and did this, we took a comprehensive look at um, at the demographics as well as some of the immunology, and we didn't see much um, effect of whether people were rural or urban or you know any of their other exposures that we could um, identify. The other thing that I'd just point out is, despite the fact that there's an HLA association, we didn't see any evidence for familial clustering. And so um, that doesn't mean that, I mean, so HLA, of course, is passed on in a variety of ways, and they're sort of more recessive. Some of these are more recessive alleles. But I think it's a reminder that these are, it's a complex mixture of a gene environment association. and. We don't always see the same gene environment association in every generation of the same family. Test. Oh, okay. Um, thank you. Amazing talk. So, in rheumatology, we use anti IL twenty three and uh, anti. Can I do this? Um, anti uh, uh, P forty IL twelve twenty three antibodies to treat psoriatic arthritis. Um, but we tend to think of them as being super safe and really not having a lot of infectious complications. So do you think it's because they act somewhere differently on the cytokine, or is it the sort of cyclical nature of delivery, or are we just really lucky and so far our patients haven't gotten terrible disseminated infections? Yeah, I, I, so that's such an important question, and I think it's a little bit of all of those. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, at least in my brief career, the, it was the work around TNF blockers that really changed everybody's thinking about how you have to um, select your patient population for studies. So in the very first TNF blocker studies, um, they gave them to a lot of people, and a lot of those people got tuberculosis. Well, you can bet that the second company out the gate did not give it to anybody that had even come close to tuberculosis. So all of a sudden, a lot of that TB exposure um, that you saw in the very first studies came out. And um, I think, you know, patient safety demands that we are very careful about um, who we put on trial. So I, I think we have to be careful about um, extrapolating from the published studies, which are usually very tightly curated, to um, what the real world experience is. That being said, I completely agree. The IL-12-23 blocking antibodies have been much less complicated by infection than the um, TNF blockers. Um, and I suspect that that's got something to do with the level of inhibition that we exact with those antibodies. Um, I don't think it's as severe as, say, what you get with emipalumab if you're blocking interferon gamma. And I think it's got to do with um, probably the relatively milder role 
that the IL-1223 receptors play in disease. So, for instance, if you look at patients who have mutations in the IL-12 receptor, they have a much more variable course than those who have mutations in the interferon gamma receptor. So my guess is that the more we look um, over time with these antibodies, the more we'll see, but they probably are safer intrinsically than some of those other ones. Yeah, it's a really important question. And it's, since I treat a lot of immunodeficient patients, um, it's something that scares me a lot because we use these drugs in that setting. Hi, thank you. Amazing talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, since there is with a lot of other patients, for example, that survived sepsis, that survived COVID, and you are seeing the increases susceptibility to another infections, could that be, since you said, you don't know the trigger, you don't know yet, but I'd like to hear what you think that could be uh, the own dysregulation of the inflammation where there was another infection never related somehow, somewhere in the time, uh, the person's life, and that is residual for that. Let me make sure I understand your question uh, or your comment. I, I think you were saying that um, COVID is likely to be activating a variety of, um, it may be activating a variety of autoantibodies after infection, and um, how many of those can we anticipate or can we recognize? And I was thinking if it is all uh, that you're seeing, the autoantibodies is a product of a previous infection. That was not severe or serious, and it is just, it could be dysregulation of the immune system in autoregulated itself, and then we have this effect appearing later in life. So you're saying, uh, is, is COVID exacerbating um, the prior uh, dysregulation that might be there? Yeah, not only COVID, it could be co any other infection. So I, um, if I'm understanding you right, you know, the, the thing that makes all of this so interesting, if you go and look at, at normal plasmas, you find these antibodies. They're all out there. And, you know, when we think about what generates antibodies, it's a relatively random process, or we say it's a relatively random process. We almost all of us have some autoantibodies to many cytokines. So I think the interesting question is what breaks that tolerance and makes us decide okay, now we're going to have antibodies to interferon alpha, interferon gamma, you know, GMCSF. And why is it that only some people get sick and some people don't? And what is it that pushes you to sustain that level of antibody over time? I presume that you're right that it can come and go uh, over a period of time. And then we wind up with some people for whom it stays. And I don't know what those factors are. We'd excuse me, love to understand that better. And trying to figure out is that a secondary HLA effect, or is it some other dysregulatory molecule in the background? I suspect that what we're dealing with is that, that difficult space between Mendelian disease, which is relatively straightforward to understand, and population uh, genetics, which is much more difficult. And, um, you know, I think it's going to take a lot more samples a lot longer to do that. I was fascinated to hear today from Steve Kunkel about the, the powerful biobank that you all have assembled here over a long period of time with hundreds of thousands of samples in it. And I think it's that kind of biobanking that eventually gets tied back to, um, to uh, you know, a biometric database that will allow us to sort that out. All of us, by the way, if, if people here aren't using all of us, um, it's a remarkable tool put together by the NIH to sequence a million people, whole genome sequencing on a million, million people, and you can access that. You can go in right now. You walk back to your computer, it takes you two minutes to log in and pick your gene of interest and say, how many mutants are there um, out of their 250,000 whole genomes available for analysis right now? It's pretty extraordinary. Uh, hi, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I'm a third-year PhD student um, here, and I have a comment and a question. 
Um, so I'm originally from Pakistan. I came here three years ago. So I completely agree with the fact that the gene and environment association exists because, for example, I wasn't lactose intolerant when I was in Pakistan, but now I am. And I know a couple of more people who have you know, gone through this, in, this molecular change um, as well. And when I go back to Pakistan, I cannot drink the regular water there like I used to. I get diarrhea, right? Um, so this gene environment is association exist. Again, not sure about the basis of it, but it's definitely there. Uh, my question, however, is be uh, because I come from a cancer-specific lab from Arul Chanayan, um, I was uh, listening to your presentation and wondering whether this auto, um, auto antibody auto mechanism also exists in, let's say, prostate cancer, where we know that the tumor is immunologically cold or the MHC expression is very low as compared to other cancer types like kidney cancer, right? So have you ever come across or dealt with something that is cancer specific? Okay, a, a terrific uh, points and questions. So let me just say at the, at the first, your first point, um, you know, this is where I think um, trying to integrate the microbiome into um, what we know about humans, um, we're just at the beginning of that stage. And that is going to be a major computational and um, sequencing undertaking that I suspect will have implications for virtually everything. And um, you know, from everything from cancer to lactose intolerance to you name it. And uh, the new director of the NIID, the successor to Tony Fauci, Jeannie Marazzo, um, who just took over on September 24th. We're very excited to have her uh, on board. She's really interested in the human microbiome. So I'm hoping that we'll have uh, a lot more interest there. In terms of so cancer specific or cancer related uh, autoantibodies, no, I have not, I know nothing about those, but that's just because I know nothing about them. And I have a hard enough time getting my colleagues in infectious disease and immunology to pay attention to autoantibodies, let alone talking to oncologists. I can barely get oncologists to pay attention to germline uh, mutation as a predisposing risk to cancer. So I have lots of work cut out for me before I get to that one. Um, but there's, you know, the tools, the tools are out there. And I completely agree that there will have to be some um, antibodies that inhibit um, cytotoxic responses, I presume, that make people more susceptible to solid tumors or lymphomas, um, maybe even leukemias. There have been plenty of speculations over the years about what might be causing different leukemias uh, in terms of uh, viruses and so on. And not all of those things have to be that the virus itself is causing the leukemia. There might be immune responses to viruses that are uh, involved. So I think it's an extremely fertile topic, and um, I look forward to your researching it and telling me what you find. Steve, first off, thank you very much. Your lab and, and Building 10 has been an incredible resource for us here with patients that we've sent to you. You've been phenomenal in helping us. Thank you. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, it's interesting as an internist, you know, sometimes I forget about Mendelia genetics. Uh, and we think that we're on our own. But what, what we're seeing, in fact, in, in some of these patients, you know, in, in the patients who had the interferon signaling defects, they were in their 30s when they died from COVID. So right. um, we've, we've sent patients to you that, that initially started out with one manifestation and then developed autoimmune phenomenon later on. And I think with the ubiquity of genetic testing now, all of these patients need to have genetic screening, no matter what their age is, to make sure that there isn't some underlying disorder that then leads to the other abnormalities. I'm sure you agree with me. I could not be more emphatically in agreement with you. And um, that's precisely why we have a program, every single patient who comes into our program, whether they're five years old, 50 years old, 90 years old, whether they're a normal healthy volunteer or something else, every one of them gets a whole genome sequence. Because until you understand the denominator, you'll never understand the numerator. And if you don't look, you can't find. And um, you know this idea that genetics is only important for uh, immune defects in infancy and cardiovascular disease in old age, again, no, no offense to my colleagues, but 
you know, there's got to be a bigger role for genetics in everything from cancer to infection susceptibility to, you know, to bone metabolism. And if we don't start trying to do this and do it prospectively, we're going to constantly be caught on, and hoist by the same petard of saying, well, that guy's sick. I did that sequencing. Look what I found. But you don't know what that means. You don't know what the rate of that is in the general population until you take a prospective look the same criteria we would insist on for a drug approval. Until you take a prospective look at populations, you just can't know. Couldn't agree more. <laughs>